Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Life Coach Cindy Chavez. This is your daily dose of happy, and we're so happy you decided to join us today. Uh, Cindy and I are uh, kind of, uh, th- we're recording this a day after Election Day, so we're kind of in the same mode that everybody else was on that day, we're just kind of in decompression mode. And, uh, you know, that's a good t- day to do a show, I think, because these shows are always energy boosters, right? So, you know, it's, it's a good way to kind of revitalize and re-energize. I had the same thought. I didn't sleep much last night due to just staying up really late. Uh, and mm-hmm. I, kn- I knew that was going to be the case, right? If somebody said, oh, are, are you, maybe you should just not watch, you know? And I said, oh, no. Like, I, <laughs> look, it's me you're talking to. Like, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to watch. Like, I, I can't not do it. I can't stop myself. I can't help myself. So, Ended up staying really late. I admit I had a couple glasses of wine, maybe three, which is one and a half too many. Um, mm. Went to bed. I, I shouldn't have stayed up and watched that late because I there was something I knew, and we do this to ourselves all the time, right? It's like we know something is going to have a certain result. Like I knew we wouldn't know a true number last night. Right. I knew we wouldn't. And I knew yep. it would, and everybody told us how it was going to play out, and we're watching it play out that way. And I still watched, and I still felt, of course, we had some things in my state that passed that I wasn't big fans of, so that was kind of depressing. Um, mm. But I, I slept five hours and woke up feeling much better. And, you know, I'm mm. telling people that all the time, right? Like, get enough sleep, drink enough water, all the basic things, because you will feel better. No kidding. <laughs> Yeah, and we've talked about that too. And so I thought about it. when I woke up, I, I, you know, emotionally I felt better. Physically, I was just kind of tired and draggy, and I thought, oh. And then I thought, you know, the podcast will do me good because it's a vibe lifter, right? Just to get it in, is. talking about these things is is important. And so, yeah, so it's 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 going, it's it's happening. We're all feeling a little bit better, a little bit more hopeful, a little, you know, just a little better. And depending on when you're hearing this, I mean, uh, our regular podcast listeners will probably, in most cases, hear this within a day or two of us recording it. Uh, people listening to, uh, like, the, the local cable access, they'll probably not see this for another week. Um, people listening to PRN, they'll hear it in about two days. You know, so they're hearing it at different things at different, different times or seeing it at different times. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, just depending on who you are, what, what audience you're in, you know. Uh, but the one thing that is in common with all of that is it's all after. And... There are going to be some people who really didn't get affected, which is a good thing. That means they weren't paying so much attention that they were getting all wrapped up in it. But right. let's be honest. I think most people were pretty much wrapped up in it. And, uh, you know, you kind of need to, do, to decompress. So I, I guess I'm just repeating the same thing. I love having the podcast to do for the same reason you just said. It, it's a vibe lifter. It feels yeah. good. It feels and that's good. really what our goal is anyway, you know, with every yeah. one of these shows that we do. Hey, I think we're pretty uh, honest and forthright about recognizing that, life is not going to be 100% happy all the time. Mm. I mean, it's just not, but we also recognize that we can, when we can make the conscious choice to spend, you know, a segment of time uh, feeling better. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Did I talk about this on a podcast recently? I, I talked about it to a group, um, but the idea that, um, Look, even looking at baby animal pictures, you know, we always joke about, oh, gosh, I'm just Mm -hmm. going to go scroll like cat pictures on Twitter or something. But that doing that actually, um, you know, doing something consciously and specifically to lift your vibe, even for a few seconds, um, it builds emotional resiliency. It does. Yes. And so we do recognize that we're going to have contrast. Mm-hmm. We we're totally open about that. We recognize that that's a human thing and it happens to everyone. And it's not something that you're doing wrong if you have a moment of contrast, but that we also can choose to figure out what we can do to feel better. And this is, that's why we say daily dose of happy, you know, it's that's like, right. uh, you know, at least we're, you know, even in our shows that get really heavy and serious, we have moments of happiness. <laughs> Lots of laughter, yeah, which is yeah. one of the best ways to break through, no doubt about that. And also, I think it, I think there's also something to be said for the idea that because we're focusing on your daily dose of happy, it means we're not just 
like you said, we're not we're not expecting everything to be a hundred percent wonderful all the time. I mean, life just isn't like that. Right. Um, but one of the greatest skills we can develop along the way, and I think this is where the show really contributes well, is the skill of finding what's the silver lining in the stuff that we don't like that's going on. Yeah. We have lots of practice with that, and and there, there, <laughs> this whole election cycle depend. It, I mean, regardless of which side of the fence you're on, there were lots. I have lots of opportunities to practice finding silver linings. Now, did most people go to find silver linings? Maybe not so much, <laughs> but that's what we're trying to encourage here. We're trying to encourage finding those silver linings because they actually help. They put, they create that vibe that we talk about. They create that high vibe or higher vibe uh, feeling that basically gets, I mean, we can actually get to the point, and I don't know about you, I've gotten to this point quite a bit now, where even when the bad stuff happens, it just doesn't bother me as much anymore. And that, I mean, how much work could you ask for? You know, you go through something rough and it doesn't even bother you. Well, you know, when we, when we talk about um, illness and disease in people, it's, it's almost 99% there because of stress. Yeah. And so anytime we can laugh, anytime we take a deep breath, anytime we can look for a silver lining, like you said, you know, the, the, um, I learned this a long time ago, and I've seen it since plenty of times, but that the Chinese character for the word, um, I think, problem, is also the same character for the word opportunity. Mm, yeah. Right? And so when, when we start to look at problems and try to see the opportunity or the silver lining, then something shifts in us that causes us to have less of a stress response. Mm -hmm. And when we have less stress, we get sick less often. It's better for our immune system. So, you know, it all kind of connects together. It and, does. Yeah, just being able to say, uh, you know, we, we've told the story so many times, I won't tell it again, but good luck, bad luck. Oh, right, yes. Right, and I, I mean, all of my clients, I, they have heard me say, you know, the story and say, oh, good luck, bad luck, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many times my, a family member, a friend, myself will have some problem, like you said, and then say, eh, good luck, bad luck. We don't know. It's not over yet. And then they'll show up, a client will show up at their next session and say, guess what happened? Or I'll get an email and they'll tell me something great that happened that was sort of connected to that terrible thing. <laughs> so mm -hmm. when we can start to understand that, there's an ebb and a flow to life, and, and it, it's just a stress reliever. I think a vibe lifter is a stress reliever. So try to laugh. Watch a funny movie sometimes yeah. if we need to lift it <laughs> So I got a wonderful email from be, 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 Before you do the email, I want, I want yeah. to bring up something that Josie brought up in, in the live stream because she raised a question about what we're talking about here. She says, from her experience, being disciplined with affirmations helps her um, – make herself feel better, feel worthy in this particular case. And that, because the title of the show is feeling worthy and you're, we're going to get to that with the email that you're right. about to read. But what do you think about that? What, what is it? Is affirmations really the deal? Uh, you know, I, I love this question and I actually have a little trick for affirmations that I find useful. Um, affirmations can be really, really powerful. The time that they're not powerful is if we don't believe them. Mm hmm. Right. So an affirmation is just a statement of something as if it is true. So, you know, for instance, we could say we are so excited that our podcast has 10 million listeners. All right. Now, I like that idea. <laughs> if we say it and it feels good and this is how you gauge it. Right. If yep. it feels good, then, yeah, just go with it and imagine that. Assume that feeling of the wish fulfilled and recognize how awesome it is to have 10 million listeners. Yeah. But if you say it, my podcast has 10 million listeners, and suddenly you feel worse because your brain is saying, Psh, no, it doesn't. You only have, you know, five listeners or whatever, right? <laughs> then you need to readjust it. So some of the ways I readjust an affirmation is to say our podcast is in the process of collecting, mm -hmm. right? Or, sure. or having um, 10 million subscribers um, yeah. or, you know, some put it in some way. I'm learning how to treat my podcast as if it has 10 million subscribers. So 
affirmations that way, I always just say, just see how you feel when you say the affirmation. Because I know people that have come to me and said, affirmations don't work for me. Anytime I do an affirmation uh, about money or about my my weight or, you know, whatever they're trying to create, they say, I just feel worse because I know it's not true. I go, okay, well, then just stop that and let's right. adjust it. So the other adjustment I really love is to tie the affirmation together with the word because and then a proven fact. So the one I was teaching to my group is I said, um, you know, I, I'm a magical person because my eyes are green. Okay, so my eyes are green, and so my brain knows that, and my brain just accepts the whole thing as being true. So you could say money's just flowing into my bank account because the sky is blue. <laughs> that's clever. I like that. Right? And so your brain is like, oh, the sky is blue. So I guess that's right. Money's falling. <laughs> so you can try it. Um, I, think I like another thing that you did, too. You, I remember this from about, I think it was about a year and a half ago. Um, you were playing around with the affirmation, I feel rich. And you, you yeah. chose that one for a very specific reason. I did. That's that's important, too. That's a good one, too. Is I chose. In, somebody said, why didn't you choose I am rich? And I said, well, because I know that my brain, regardless of how much money I have at that given time, my brain can still argue about it and be like, no, you're not rich. You know, Bill Gates is rich, but you're not rich. You don't have that much. And so I decided, but it doesn't matter how much I have, I can still feel rich. Mm. So I started, I actually did an experiment. So I took a, I took a, I didn't have any prayer beads at the time. I wanted to use them to count a thousand affirmations. So I found, I live in Louisiana, so I have a closet full of Mardi Gras beads. So I went and grabbed <laughs> this great. thing of Mardi Gras beads. I love that. <laughs> and they're actually, they're hanging back here. I, I grabbed them and I sat in the chair and I decided that for, I don't know how long I did it for, like a month maybe? I decided for yeah, a month it, that every day that. I was going to say a thousand affirmations of, I feel rich. And it was really funny because my husband and I would be, you know, at a restaurant or something back in the day when we all could go to restaurants and right, we, would right. like, we would like make a toast and we would say, I feel rich. I feel rich. And we would, <laughs> we would say it all the time and people would look over. It. It's so funny. <laughs> but we started just saying, I feel rich. We would just walk in the room and go, I feel rich. And the other person would go, I feel rich. And we would just say it all the time. And then something crazy started happening. Like we went to lunch one day. We were probably a week into this. And the waiter came to bring us our, our check, and he said, oh, by the way, we picked this up for you today. Have a great day. And we were like, hmm. And then it just, and then we started getting like, oh, unexpected check in the mail. And then somebody gifted us with, um, I can't remember, somebody brought us a, a gift of a, a bottle of wine at a restaurant. I don't, it's just like things kept happening where we were like, I don't, wow, where is this coming from, you know? And then was I that also this, the one, Was that the one where there was also a car repair? Yes. I yeah. do I do remember that right. Okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember that. What exactly happened? I, I, I think like you had a loaner car that was like a, a beautiful loaner oh. car. <laughs> yes. We <laughs> we had to get the car fixed and we took it in and they gave us this gorgeous uh, Mercedes loaner car. And then they kept calling us and saying um, we're sorry, your car isn't fixed yet. We're, we got the part, but it was the wrong one. Or we're waiting on this, or we're waiting on that. Or are the guy that was going to fix it out? And we had this car for like, I don't know, two weeks or some ridiculous thing. We kept saying, that's fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, for whatever reason, I stopped. And every time I tell the story, I go, you got to start that again. That was lovely. Yeah, no kidding. You had some <laughs> great results out of that one. Yeah. That, that, that's kind of similar to uh, Dan Mangana's Money Game. Where, where he, he uh, basically trains you through his book to expect that you're going to get little bits of money here and there. It's just going to come out of thin air. It's the same principle. You, you, you got yourself into that feeling mode, and then you just kept doing it every single day. What was it? A thousand times a day you did your affirmation. And it just got you into that feeling mode, and you started to, to expect it, and, and stuff started to show up, which is yeah. cool. And here's what I figured. I actually, I can't remember now, but I actually timed it. Like, I timed how long it took to do one row of beads, which is 100 or 108. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I knew the time of it. So I extrapolated that, right. And I was like, okay, this is how much time it takes. And so I would just spend that amount of time. 
So it's like 20 minutes or however long it took. Sometimes I do 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there, and I just know that mm-hmm. at the course of the day I would have done it. I don't think there's any magic in the number, you know, but I just wanted it to be a big number. I wanted it to be yes. like I wanted to get into it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And so there's all different ways you can do affirmations. Uh, and once you find ones that work for you, I think, I think that's the kind of trick of it is knowing that it's working, that you're feeling good. Like we – we did that in a very lighthearted way. And so, like I said, we would say, hey, I feel rich. I feel rich. You know, it would kind of lift every vibe of everyone that was doing it. And it just felt good. So if it feels good, then it's probably working for you. Yeah. Uh, if you feel worse, then drop it, you know. Well, that's pretty much true for anything. If it's feeling good, do it again. Just yeah. keep going with it, you know, because it's feeling good. It, it, the whole idea is just to get into that good feeling mode anyway. However you get there, it almost doesn't even matter. And affirmations are they can be a very good way. And if, if they are working to produce that result, <laughs> go with it. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. Don't stop <laughs> yeah. like Cindy did. <laughs> no, don't stop. I, you know what happens is I, I'll be doing something and then I'll think of some other thing to do or I'll read about some other thing and, and I'll just go, oh, that sounds good. And I do that. And, you know, until – and I think it's part of my process too is that it's not that I stop because it wasn't fun anymore. I probably just – I'm very capricious that way. And sometimes it just – find some other thing I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I do finish things though. Like I finish books, mm. right? I usually have like five books going at once, but I wow. do finish, I do finish them. <laughs> 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 so we got an email and I want to really share it because I think this is very interesting. It's a sure. relatively new listener who says, um, I love listening to you on LOA today. And I have a suggestion for a show topic. So I got really excited when I read that part. I just, oh, yeah. Crazy. We love these. Yeah. So the writer says, I would love if you did a show about being and feeling worthy. Mm-hmm. A lot of the shows touch on the topic, but I would really benefit from a deep dive into the subject. I've discovered that my feelings of unworthiness that are entrenched from childhood cause me feelings of defensiveness, misdirected anger, and guilt. And I would love an LOA Today episode that would help us listeners unravel all of that. And I thought this was fantastic. And, you know, the the affirmation question plays right into this, right? Because uh, I actually know a coach and one of the um, exercises that she actually gave to me when she coached me years ago, and I know she gives to other clients, is she will have them. You know when you were in school and you got in trouble for something and you had to write, I will not, whatever. Oh, right. (laughs) Writing lines, we called it. Writing lines. She would have them write, I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy. Mm. Over and over. And it's one of those, you know, repetition things where pretty soon your brain starts believing it because you've told it that so many times. But I think that worthiness is a really important topic. Uh, to discuss because so many people struggle with feeling worthy. And what was funny is that I actually had this discussion this morning with someone who brought it up um, on a call, a coaching call. And I thought, and it hit me, I thought, oh gosh, this is like the same kind of thing I want to talk about on the podcast. Yeah. And what it was, was the concept of not the concept of worthiness, but the concept of, deserving Mm -hmm. I think they get tangled up and I think that the concept of deserving is really bogus and it's sort of like the idea that we talked about a little while ago of that everything's going to be you know uh, cakes and ale a hundred percent of the time (laughs) it's like once you know this stuff your life will be happy every single minute and that's just not going to happen. I mean, we live on earth and look around you. Like I, it's probably not going to happen. So the idea of deserving, here's why I think it's similar and why I think it's complete completely bogus. So when we're little, we get told things like if you're a good little girl, Santa's going to bring you all these wonderful presents. Right. Or if you do well on your test, then you can go out to the big event Friday night. But if you don't get a good grade on your test, then you have to stay in. Um, so why? You didn't deserve to go out. You didn't deserve Santa to bring you the present. So we get this idea 
that the better we are or the more good things we do, the better life's going to be. And that, cause we deserve these things. I remember mm-hmm. when I went, when I was going through my divorce and it was pretty bad. And some of my friends said to me, you don't deserve this. Or people would say you deserve better, right? Mm-hmm. Like when something happens to you, maybe, you know, you get mistreated or maybe you get fired from your job or something. And people that love you will say, Oh, you didn't deserve that. And I knew what they meant. I knew that they were just, expressing their love for me right and they 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 wanted me to have a better experience but i also never buy into that concept of deserve because of this reason because life on earth isn't always what we would call fair and so if we work really hard for something and we we do the things so we think we deserve it like i really worked hard for this promotion and then i didn't get it someone else got the promotion then I feel like life isn't fair. And I feel like that down in that lower level of energy, right? Nothing works out for me. Life isn't fair. I worked so hard and I didn't get what I deserved. The flip side of that is what about when you get it and you inside don't think you deserve it? So this, mm-hmm. now we're getting into where this gets tangled up with worthiness, right? Yeah. Like oh, absolutely. You get the bonus and you know, you didn't really you don't feel like you really deserved it. You don't feel like you really worked that hard. And so what happens? You get the bonus and then you get two flat tires the next week and the whole bonus goes to replace the tire. (laughs) Like you, you get rid of it as soon as it comes in, whatever the good thing, right? Uh, You get rid of it very quickly because you don't think you deserved it because some part of you says, well, I don't deserve this. So worthiness is not tied to anything you're doing or being it it's just you're worthy we are all worthy of what of health of happiness of feeling better um and of reaching our goals and being successful at the achievements that we want to you know to achieve so when we disconnect that that deserving part when we decide and here's the thing you can choose you can decide to believe a certain thing so you can just say you know what yeah i don't like that concept either (laughs) this is what i did i was like i don't i don't need to believe that i don't need to believe that i have to earn everything in life you know that every good experience i might have is because i deserved it because i worked so hard or whatever because i efforted for it doesn't have to be that way. I love what you're describing here, particularly the distinction between deserve and worthy, the way you're describing it. And I want to add something to it because I think what you're really, <clears throat> excuse me, what you're really highlighting is two things. First of all, if we take the word worthy and break it down to its foundation, it, the foundation is worth. So to be worthy means you have worth. Yes. You have value. Right. Deserve right. means you only have value if you do what I say to do. That's right. That's right. Well, wait a minute. That's not having value then, is it? Yeah. That's really not value at all. That is incentive or it's it's a bribe, really. Right. Perhaps even blackmail, depending on what kind of uh, incentive we're talking about here. Right. So think about, you know, you're holding a brand new baby. It's a week old. Mm-hmm. It has done nothing. It just it just came into the world and there it, it is. It got born. <laughs> that, that's the achievement for the week. It got born. <laughs> right? Doesn't it? Doesn't this little baby have worth? Of sure. course, right? But for somewhere along the line, as we grow up and we get older and we learn more things, suddenly we don't just accept the fact that we have worth that easily. And I'll tell you some of the signs that show up. Some things that show up when you're struggling with this. Um, One of the things is saying yes to every request that's made of you. Mm. Right? Like I was talking to someone that was doing so many things at their job and with their social circle. And, you know, like somebody had set up a, um, a, a thing where they were making meals for someone that needed them. I don't know what the situation was, but they were, and they signed right on for it without even thinking, even though they were so overtaxed 
where they were so exhausted and drained with so many things they were already doing. Like saying yes to every single opportunity to, to do good or to help or to be there. And look, I'm all for doing good and helping. I'm all for contributing money where I can. I'm all for saying, yes, I'm happy to help you with this. But I also recognize that I can't pour from an empty cup, right? right. I can't give when I just don't have, when I'm drained, it's that I'm giving too much and I'm not giving enough to myself. And so that's one of the signs, just saying oh, yes to everything because you don't want to say no because you don't want to, what, what are you trying to prove here? Your worth. Mm -hmm. The other, another kind of way that, that that's the same kind of thing is, and I noticed this in my very young life, um, I would have a, a to-do list. It was very, very long. And the funny thing was, is I always left it out somewhere. And I would make a little square next to the item so I could check it off, right? <laughs> I still, I still do that. Or maybe I do something not on the list. I go add it to the list and then check it, cross it off, right? So I yeah. can, right? And having that list, I realized one day that I always had that list like out somewhere. And I was like, Oh my goodness. Like I'm trying to prove my worth here mm -hmm. to myself and to anybody that might see it. It was like, see how much I do. Mm -hmm. See, do you see how hard I'm working here? You see how many things I checked off the list today? Right. Um, why? Just trying to, trying to feel like I had some worth, like I was proving to myself. And when I, when I recognized that, it was like a big splash of cold water in my face because I thought, oh my goodness, like I, I have worth. The, the third thing that happens when there's not a lot of self-worth is judgment of other people. Yes. You're going exactly where I wanted to go. So this is good. Yeah. Ju judging other people. Um, the, the more you do that, probably the bigger deficit there is of self-love and self-worth going on. Um, instead the of just, you know, like you don't really notice those things. Why, why does that happen? When I first learned that, I was like, does that make sense? Why would I do that? Why would judging other people? Well, it's because I'm actually judging myself. Mm -hmm. Those are the, those are standards I have for myself, and I see it everywhere. Because I'm not, I don't consider that I am meeting my own worthiness standard. My and own I think dessert, there's a, there's it's really deserved. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think there's a second thing that goes with it, too, which is when we do that, we're really expressing a feeling of lack. And I'll give you an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. This actually comes from yesterday's episode um, that I recorded with David Strickle. Awesome. And David was was telling the story about how he, he, he learned LOA. He didn't have a name for it, but he had basically intuitively learned it as a child because he had a very strong internal connection to, to source energy, to spirit. And he was able to use that in amazing ways, despite coming from... <laughs> Uh, let's just say the wrong side of the track's background, he just, he, he flourished from, from the get-go. Um, and he was telling the story about how he uh, had thought that acquiring money would solve all his problems, and of course it didn't. Uh, <laughs> but he also told a second story that went along with it, and, and I didn't really have a chance to pursue it because we were kind of running out of time on the episode, but it really illustrates a point that you're raising here. He, at the time that he was kind of at his peak of being great at, at uh, attracting stuff into his life, he was working as a manager slash supervisor in a company where he was basically managing commissioned salespeople. And he was really, really good at not only his job in terms of being able to sell, but in terms of helping other people to sell and to be more effective. And, and he was actually using principles of law of attraction, the things we talk about here, but he just wasn't calling it that because it wouldn't be acceptable within the corporate environment to call it that. So he was doing really well. And then the company, I think it got sold. It got sold or, or a new manager took over or something along that line. I don't remember exactly what it was. And they were talking about, new management was talking about um, starting from scratch, you know, throwing out the deadwood and, and rebuilding from inside. And, I guess it was either an associate of his or his manager or something like that said, no, 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 you don't want to get rid of David because every time that we increase the, we increase or, or raise the bar, so to speak, on what it's going to take for him to, to get his bonus, he finds a way to hit the bonus. So we'll keep increasing the bar 
and he'll keep getting his bonus. And that's why you should keep him. And I, and now he was trying to tell the story about why he was losing interest in the job. It's pretty easy to see why he was doing that. (laughs) The reason I'm bringing it up is to say that that uh, business mentality that said, we can't keep you unless we can wring more and more and more work out of you and keep setting the bar higher so that your worth is dependent upon how high you can reach for our benefit. That's a position of lack. That's a, that, that is basically an attitude of lack by the management that says, if you can't keep becoming more and more efficient, you're not worthwhile to us because that means we're not going to hit a goal or, or you're not going to reach a standard or we're not going to be able to, you know, ring more work, whatever it is. It's going to, it's, it's a, we can't do thing. We are not going to be able to, we cannot do, it's not going to happen. Well, that's lack. That's a position of lack. Right. And I doubt that they thought of it that way, but that's exactly what they were doing. They were thinking about it from lack. Exactly. Oh yeah. And the, and the deserving thing is all woven in there too. Right. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, and you know, as a human being, we only, we do have limited, uh, energy resources and emotional, you know, limitations and time, actual time limitations. And we do live in a physical 3d time space, you know, and so you can only keep doing so much more and more and more before you just wear yourself out. And, And whether it's for money in a situation like this, or whether it's for love and validation or whatever you think it's for, proving your worth by doing more and more and more. Um, mm-hmm. Eventually what happens is, and it's, it's kind of part of the process of changing this too, but it's not real comfortable because what happens is you start to get resentful. Yes. Right. Because well, David did, that's exactly what happened with him. He got yeah, resentful. He, said, why, why am I putting up with this? I don't like because this. Anymore. At some point you're like, nothing's ever enough. Yeah. And so you can actually do this with yourself as well. Because we're good at that. <laughs> no, oh, we are really good at it. And so, you know, how do we fix it? Well, I will tell you one way we fix it. And we've talked about this before, too, and it might not seem connected, but I'm convinced it is because of how many people I've talked to that have this issue, that they have a worthiness issue or uh, they feel they don't deserve things. And they have those things going on where uh, – they either they either feel defeated and like life is mistreating them because they've worked so hard and they still don't deserve or the opposite. As soon as they get it, they get rid of it because they feel unworthy. Um, whenever those things are going on, there's often another thing going on. And that is where someone is always deferring to everyone. Yes. Right. It's the, it's right in line with the saying yes to everyone. Hey, can you help me do this? Sure. Sure. When, Inside, they're thinking, oh, God, where am I going to find the time and energy to help? But I need to say yes, um, is that they stop having any preferences. So it's always like, sure, I'll do whatever you need me to do. And what would you like? Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, no preferences. And when – so the easiest way to start changing this a little bit, besides just being aware of it, and you start awareing if being aware if you're feeling, you know, unworthy when you start being aware. Um, like this person said in in the email that the way it showed up um, for them was um, defensiveness, mm-hmm. misdirected anger, and I think that starts to come from that resentment because sure. it just gets it's like a simmering lump of something inside you when you have resentment, right? And sometimes it comes out directed towards people that aren't even involved, but it's just like, ah, (laughs) and then, and guilt. So, so here is a really interesting way this plays out. Sometimes if you're saying yes to so many people, because you're trying to build up your worthiness, eventually you run out of time and energy resources and you have to say no to someone Mm -hmm. because there's only so much time and energy and money and, you know, right. And what often happens is the people that you end up saying no to are the people that are closest to you because you're trying to please the boss at work and you're trying to please your colleague and you're trying to impress, you know, so-and-so and and you're trying to do all these things and someone ends up getting left out 
where you just can't give anymore. And Including so, yourself, by the way. Yes. And then you feel guilty. Mm-hmm. Or maybe the guilt comes in because um, you because of the unworthiness directly. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just... I'm just, you know, not any good at anything and I'm just not yeah. worthy and nothing's going right for me. And then there's guilt involved. So here is, I actually really love talking about this because I think it's so great. The idea of guilt, um, guilt has a really useful function. One useful function. And it is not to make you feel like crap. Although it does. It's nice to know it has a useful one, but nobody likes to feel guilty. Yeah. Right. But the useful function is that it lets guilt lets you know what you value. That's true. So so if I feel guilty because I haven't, you know, texted my sister in a couple of weeks, why is that happening? Why do I feel guilty about it? Because I love her. Because I value our connection. Mm-hmm. Because I value being a good sister and a good friend and a part of a family. And I, so when you look at it that way, it's like, wow, you know, I love coaching people through that process because I'm like, can you see these things that you value? What, is, what do you think about yourself as being a person that values family and connection and reaching out and showing love? Isn't that great that you value those things? And so for a couple weeks or a couple years or however long you haven't honored those values, and now you feel guilty and feeling guilty feels terrible. So how can you honor those values? I mean, just start honoring those values. So that's what, that's my fix in the beginning for this is to one, start noticing when you feel guilty, connect it to what value it's attached to, and then do something to honor that value. You know, maybe something small, pick up your phone and text your sister, right? Just, you know, something little. And then the other one is every time you have the opportunity to verbalize a preference, do it. And to do it even if you aren't sure what your preference is. Yeah, just. uh, (laughs) Flip flip a coin. (laughs) Just do something. Do something. Choose something. Just choose something. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of saying, I don't care, it doesn't matter, let's do what you want. And I always have to make the little disclaimer, of course it's fine to tell your spouse or your family member or your friend, hey, I don't care, let's do what you want. Just not every single time. Right, exactly. Because You don't want to be habitual. Well, think about it. If... If every single time, and I live, I lived this story. So if every single time someone asks you what you want, you say you don't care. What energy is that putting out there? It's that it doesn't matter. Right. Is that, does that seem like it's coherent with an energy of a high value and worth? Not even close. Right. It's like they, they, they're not aligned. And so what happens when you're consistently saying, I don't care, it doesn't matter. You're, you're literally saying, it does, the things I prefer don't matter. I don't matter. My wants and desires don't matter. And you know what happens is that's what starts showing up. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Alarmingly so. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, those would be my, those are my fixes right there. Is, yeah, those are good. To start naming your preferences, yeah, that's a that's a really a really good one. And naming preferences has a, a couple of benefits to it. Uh, we've talked about this before about the researcher at UCLA or USC yeah. who discovered working with uh, brain damaged people that uh, particularly those people who experience damage to the parts of the brain that express and well not so much express but feel and feel. and detect and, and, and emit emotion. They, they yeah. demonstrate emotion. Um, it, and so if you're, if, if you're damaged in that part of your brain and you're asked to express a preference, it turns out you can't express the preference because you need to have that emotional connection in order to express the preference. Preferences and emotions are directly tied together, it turns out, which like makes sense. Literally I mean, physically tied together in the brain. Yes. Yes. Right. And so here's what's cool. Uh, when we look at the energetic scale, the seven levels of energy, which is that it's, it's, um, Bruce Schneider's, uh, 
method of, or what would you call that? It's his model of mm -hmm. energy, energy leadership. The bottom level is that low level of energy, and it literally does match up to that emotional guidance scale to the bottom levels, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like depression, victimhood, sadness, despondency. It's when you feel hopeless. And we've all had moments there. Sure. Hopefully, hopefully we haven't spent, you know, big chunks of time there, but sometimes you do um, when you're grieving a loss or something. Sometimes you're way down there. And as you go up the scale, you go from that level to the level of conflict. <laughs> That's kind of like, okay, I'm not going to take this anymore. <laughs> right. I'm mad as hell. Out here in victim <laughs> mode, and I'm tired of it. Okay. And then the next level is responsibility, and the next level is compassion. We're going up. The, the mm -hmm. next level is where all things are sort of related, and we go all the way up. When we get to that top level that on the emotional scale is – passion and love and joy. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are emotions. Yep. That level is the level of also that I like to call uh, the Jesus level because of the stories about <laughs> Jesus walking on water, yes. turning water into wine, right? Uh, miracles, mm -hmm. magic, miracles, cool synchronicities, wonderful things. It's also the level where artists and musicians um, you know, create it because it's the level of creation. It's the level of being able to, you know, feed a crowd of people with one fish or whatever Jesus did. Yeah. It's, it's the level of creation. And we're talking about conscious creation here. So the way I'm putting this together is that if you are someone who has denied your own preferences forever and you start losing your preferences, and we've made the connection through that research that preferences and emotions are connected. What are you also going to lose? You're going to lose the ability to experience vivid emotion. Mm -hmm. And if That's you a key can't, thing too. and if you That's can't really tap into that emotion of joy and passion and love and all those things at the top, then you're not going to be able to manifest anything consciously. So these things are all tied together. Your worthiness is directly tied through that path to your ability to consciously create your experience. So In this fact, is a when, very when good we, question. When, when we experience uh, the, the experience you've talked about where um, somebody asks you, what would you like to do? Where would you like to go? And, oh, I don't care. Right. What we're really expressing at that point is I'm not detecting an emotional response that I want to give on this. So I'm, I'm just going to pass. Yeah. And every time that we do that, we're basically saying, I don't want to have an emotional preference come up. And so we start training ourselves to not feel emotions. Right. It's just flat. Yeah. Everything gets very flat very quickly. And then we wonder why it is that our life is, is getting flat. <laughs> well, you know, and this is a common thing that some people do that have been um, hurt. Yeah. Right. Or they've been traumatized is they start shutting out emotions, period, because it's mm. painful to be vulnerable and to feel things. And so, you know, if you're in that space where you've not let yourself feel, then starting to recognize a preference is the beginning of opening back up to where you can experience some emotions. Uh, in the live stream, Jeffrey raised uh, an interesting point. I want to bring it in and see what you think about this. He says, I like to say, I'm happy either way. So somebody asks him, what would you prefer? And he says, I'm happy either way. What do you think of that? Uh, I think that that's really close to just deferring all the time. Yeah, and, I, so I, you know, here, here's the, the upside of it is that you're consciously speaking that you will be happy. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it becomes something we say. And what I think is important to look for is, and I, I had somebody say this to me this week. They said that they will sometimes say, I'm happy either way because they don't want to cause a conflict mm. because they, because they actually in their mind, while their words are saying, 
doesn't matter to me. I'm happy either way. They actually do have a preference. Like one of those things, they actually, you know, like let's just make a really simple question. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, would you rather go uh, to this restaurant or that right? restaurant A or restaurant B? And the person likes both places. But they'd really like to go to restaurant B. But they think the other person probably won't. And they don't want to cause a conflict. And they don't want to cause the other person to have to go somewhere they don't want to go. So since they like both places, they say, well, I'm happy either way. Mm -hmm. Right? But inside, and the person said this to me. They said, but inside my mind, I do have a preference sometimes. But I just don't bring it up. So, you know, I think that sometimes you actually are, and that's what I talk about. Look, I'm not telling you to never go with the other person's idea. Yeah. Right? Sometimes we truly are happy either way. But if it's the thing you say every time, I'd start watching for if there actually is a little bit of a preference there, if you really would prefer one over the other. And then and then be okay with saying, I'd really prefer this. And recognize that sometimes the person you're with is going to say, well, I I don't want to do that. And then you can say, okay, right? I mean, you can either stick to your guns and say, well, that's the only thing I want. Or (laughs) say, well, I guess I'd be happy either way. But here's the thing. You you verbalized a preference. This isn't about... This is not about forcing everyone in your life to always do it your way. That's not what I'm talking about. But it is about you recognizing that you, you have personal preferences, desires, wants, goals, right? You have those things and that you're worthy of having those things. It's not about, you know, being a tyrant and forcing everybody to do it your way. It's just about recognizing that no one is above you or beneath you, Mm -hmm. right? If you truly believe that you have the same worth as a human being, as any other human being, then it's okay to voice your preference for things, for whatever it is. And There's an ironic yeah. thing, too, that goes along with all this conversation. This is really good. I like the in-depth nature of what we're talking about here. Uh, but the thing that I want to bring in is when we talk about worth or self-worth associated with having a preference, we're still equating our worth with our preference. And I'm not saying that we should you never do that kind of thing. I'm simply saying we are we're making our preference, or depending on how you want to look at it, we're making our self-worth conditional well self-worth isn't conditional yeah no i don't think I, 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 if that's the way it sounds that's not what i'm intending what i'm intending to say is that you are worthy of having a preference just like everyone else so mm-hmm. when you constantly are deferring and saying i don't care doesn't matter the message sounds like it really doesn't matter what i want why well you're more important you know i'm i i'm not worthy i'm not deserving whatever And so when we start to verbalize our preference, we're just lifting our worth up to the level of anyone else's worth. Yes. Right? I agree with that. Yes. It's not, it's not dependent on you getting the thing, having the thing. It's not like I'm worth more because I have a big paycheck or this grand title. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it's just you allowing you to recognize that your preferences are important. And and that's really what the key is to the whole picture because a funny thing happens when we do get to the point where we're able to comfortably say, I do have a preference and I'm, I'm worthy of having that. What happens is we just tend to, over time, stop dropping, we start dropping the second part about I'm worthy of that. We're all right, we already assume the worthiness. It's not even a question anymore. So now we just simply have preferences, which is exactly right. what it's supposed to be in the first place because now we're not tying worthiness to anything. It's just worthiness is already there. Exactly. Deal with it, yeah. <laughs> and then when you have preferences, and this is the, the key here, when you have preferences, the part of your brain that fires when you have a preference, as opposed to, you know, I tell that story that I deferred to everybody forever about everything. What do you want to yeah. eat? I don't care. Where do you want to go? I don't care. What movie do you want to say? I don't care. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That was my only answer. So I imagine it's just a very little point in my brain that was like sparking. <laughs> Yes. So when I decided I was going to have actual answers for people, it was almost hard 
like, you know, when you have to do something that you don't do very often and you really have to think and you can kind of feel like your brain, like struggling, like, oh, this is, I have to really think hard about this. It doesn't come easy. Like things I do every mm-hmm. single day, like learning new software or something. Right. Um, it was like that for me just to say, I want to eat pizza, you know, just to say what I wanted. It was kind of hard. And I realized this because my brain was growing new neural connections. And so when you connect that activity to emotions and realize that they are really connected, the emotions are what are, are the key to creating the experience you want. And we all decide that we want certain things because we think it will provide a particular emotion. So this is all just like very meta, you know, it's like a Gordian knot or something. It's all connected. (laughs) It is all connected. And, And it's also, uh, it's good to remind ourselves that when we are actively expressing preferences, when we're actively, uh, standing up for our emotions, what we're really doing is we're training ourselves to select emotions on demand rather than have our emotions be fed to us by circumstances. Yeah. Then we respond instead of react. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's a conscious and response. That, yeah. that is the essence of success with conscious creation because the emotions are where all the power come from. Yes. It, it originates with your thought. But what gives the thought its power, what builds it up is the emotion we attach to it. And then that turns into a belief and that just becomes, it becomes the Abraham vortex. <laughs> it just builds and builds and builds and builds, but it won't build without the emotion. You don't have the emotion there. What, what, what does Neville say? You assume the feeling of the wishful field. You got right. the emotion. Right. There. And you know, it's interesting. I was just thinking about that level of energy that, that we use when we're creating um, and the, and how it, how emotion is important to that and to how everything we've been talking about. I remember reading a story um, about Stevie Nicks who has made lots of music in her career. Oh yes. And at one point in her life, I think she was beating some kind of addiction and she saw someone that gave, that put her on um, a medication that just created where she had no highs and no lows. Right just flat and she was on it for a long time and she said her ability to create music she even talks about the i don't remember what album it was but the album that she made during that time was just she said it was terrible it was just flat like everything was flat and i think oh wow that is that is the physical actual manifestation of this that we're talking about now in her case that flatness and that lack of emotion came from taking a drug but it can happen without a drug, right? If we, sure. especially if we do it to ourselves by always tamping down those emotions that we don't want. So, yeah, preferences. Very big deal. <laughs> um, I want to make sure that I get the announcements in, so I'll do that in a moment. But before I do, Jeffrey brought in another wrinkle on what he was saying earlier. So I, I wanted to, to have you address this too. He says, how about being happy going with the flow? He's trying to find a way to say it's different. I, I used to use that one too. <laughs> See, here's the thing is that I, I was a person that didn't like conflict of any kind. I mean, I still don't like conflict. And, you know, but I'm an, I'm an expert in conflict resolution at this point, right? So I'm not really afraid <laughs> Sorry, of the, these, these are my new headphones that are giving me a hard time. I keep playing <laughs> music, so f- forgive me for that. <laughs> I love the bumper music. They just so won't I, stop. <laughs> so I think that Jeffrey going with the flow, um, you know, I think that sometimes it's great. And I think that other times it's the excuse that we use to not have a preference. I mean, because I said those words myself and it was my, it was my reasoning for deferring all the time. Oh, I just, I want to be easy going. Oh, just go with the flow, you know? Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's fantastic. Sometimes going with the flow is going to bring you to a place you wouldn't have gone before and you can discover new things and it's wonderful. Um, so I'm not, you know, saying never defer, never go with the flow, never recognize that you'll be happy with either one. Sometimes we truly are. Um, I'm just saying recognize if you have a preference and be willing to say it. That's good. Yeah. 
Because that preference, like we said, you, if you're experiencing the ability to express preference, you are experiencing the ability to co- connect to emotions. And that, yeah, and, that's and look, really here's the, the thing. thing. You're going to have enough opportunities to go with the flow, even yeah, if there's you gonna be lots of your that. preference every time, right? Because I can say, well, I want to see this movie. Okay, let's go. And then what happens when we get in the car and we start to go there? We hit a big bump in traffic and we're not going to make the film. What do we say then? Eh, let's just go with the flow. We'll see what happens, right? So there's always opportunities to go with the flow because we live on Earth. Um, and you can still have your preferences. <laughs> Exactly right. And, and in fact, I'll add on to that. I'll kind of pile on and say not only are there opportunities to go with the flow, but they, the flow actually takes off when we express preferences. Yes, I think you so. You don't too. really get flow going without preferences. Yeah, because you don't have that level of emotion. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did want to get the promo messages in before I forget, so let me do that. Um, first things first, uh, to all people who are new to the podcast, particularly people listening or perhaps watching on local cable access, people listening on PRN, uh, people who maybe are checking us out for the first time on YouTube, um, we want to encourage you to download the LOA Today app, which is available to everyone for free. It's available on both iPhones and Android phones. Um, and once you download and install it, not only does it include all of the episodes that we're recording five days a week, but it also includes some goodies. It includes, it, it includes opportunities to build that skill of making preferences, among other things. Yeah. And uh, included in there is Dan Mangana's Money Game. There's Cindy's uh, book, the, um, um, the, the Guide to Soulmate uh, Success. There's uh, Linda Armstrong's uh, High Vibe Living. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's in there, really, really good stuff. So take advantage and... Uh, while you're taking advantage and exploring and getting to know it and getting to like it, share it with a friend because we want to keep expanding our ability to find those friends that we can have the question asked from the friend saying, well, which restaurant do you want to go to? <laughs> so please do get the down- and download the uh, LOA Today app and, and share with a friend and, and enjoy it because it's our free gift to you. Excellent. So, okay, I think we did a pretty good job covering I this. I mean, yeah. we, we've, we've covered all the angles, I think. I don't think we've missed any. Um, let's see if we can tie it together. So, like, in, in one minute, what, what's, what do we need to remember about building and, and thriving with our own sense of self-worth? Well, I think we need to remember that it's not attached to anything we do. Our worthiness is, is we're worthy because we're a human being. And it doesn't have to be attached to anything that we do. So when we find ourselves feeling resentful, feeling exhausted, saying yes too often, we can ask ourselves if that's in an attempt to validate our worthiness or earn some kind of deserving. And besides that, we can just start paying attention to our preferences and being willing to verbalize them. I think those are the two really important things. But, Those are really important. Yeah, and, you know, with preference con- con- uh, connected to emotion, it's that allow yourself that uh, that preference and just watch things shift and change because it will. And I think we can also add in having preference and expressing preference, it makes life more enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, seriously, when we start expressing preferences – what, it's like anything else that we give our attention to. Law of attraction says when we give attention to something, we get more of it. So when we give our attention to our preferences, what do we get? We get more preferences. We get more opportunities to do th- things that we enjoy in life. And isn't that what it's all about anyway? Isn't yeah. that why we, we do all this stuff about trying to attract things into our life? Because we're trying to have a better life. Mm-hmm. So what better way to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. That was great, Cindy. I love I love the fact you brought in this topic, and thank you to the listener who sent it in. We really yes. appreciate it, and yes. hopefully this uh, this answered the question in spades for you. I hope so too. <laughs> I think that's a good chance. So thank you once again, and thank you to the live streamers for uh, their comments because that helped a whole lot. And believe it or not, I'm actually going to be playing the theme music in a way that makes sense. So <laughs> with that thought in mind, we'll see you all next time here on Elway Today. Bye.